PCC and invite Pastor Chrisley to share her message. Good morning. So this morning we're going to conclude the uh, forgiveness series with the power of forgiveness. And you may be wondering, what's the difference between the authority to forgive and the power of forgiveness? Well, today we're going to um, learn about what happens when we forgive. And there's a lot of things that happens when we do forgive. And so um, I, uh, I want to review why I am uh, preaching this series because this beginning of the year, I wanted a goal for our church and I wanted everyone to be healthy physically in our church. So I wanted to cover all the topics that would make us healthy. And if you really think about it, forgiveness is worth it. I know a lot of you lift weights, pump iron, pay a lot of expensive gym fees, buy those expensive protein powders, which may or may not have questionable protein in there. You have to ask yourself, where does all that protein come from? All right, anyways, you can answer that on your own, but I know you guys spend a lot of time, effort, money at the gym. I see your Instagram posts of your pictures. It's all right. Um, but anyways, you can spend a lot of time and effort in forgiveness, and it'll give you a lot of uh, health and happiness too. Um, so think of it as an investment for yourself. The, spiritually, there are things that you can do to prevent and cure sickness if you already have it. Declare good health over yourself. Take care of the body that you gave you uh, that he gave you. Don't accept sickness when you feel like getting sick. And then forgiveness is probably the magic bullet that will prevent you from getting sick if you're not sick. And if you are sick, it will be the cure to uh, to healing. Um, and so I wanted to um, review. In Jesus, we are forgiven. And we have the authority to forgive. And I, I want you to understand how important that is. People do not really forgive others until Jesus Christ came on the face of this earth. We just fall out of favor with each other. We used to be good friends, and then we're not good friends anymore. And then, and then we try to get back with each other. If we did something wrong, we try to say sorry, make up for the feelings, make up for whatever. That's not forgiveness. True forgiveness is erasing away that wrongness. And so there was no erasing or taking away of sins or wrongness completely until Jesus Christ came and took it away for us. And as a result, in the Old Testament, Jesus never commanded anybody to forgive because we are unable to forgive. But in the New Testament, what we just read in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins so that we can give forgive others, those who sin against us. So now we are commanded to forgive. And here's my favorite part. How should we forgive? All right, remember that. Um, and then last week, I gave you some reasons to forgive because if we don't forgive, um, then some bad stuff goes on. And so Jesus commanded us to forgive. That means we can forgive. We forgive because Jesus commanded us, and because he commanded us, we know we are able to forgive. Second, forgiveness is not accepting of what that person did, um, the wrong that they did. It doesn't mean you have to accept it. Um, forgiveness is completely separate from trusting people. You can forgive people without having to trust them. You can forgive people without having to accept what they did was right, it, especially if it was wrong. So forgiveness is not you condoning or accepting any sin. Some people link it together so they feel like they can't forgive because it was wrong. Well, it's not. Forgiveness is completely between you and God and that person, and when you forgive, you can be free, because now there's not that negative tightrope binding you, that negative feelings binding you with that person, that anger, and all those things that come with it. You have cut that rope, not the game, but you cut that rope, and you set yourself free, and you separate yourself from that person who did that awful thing to you, and now you and God are right again with each other, and God, uh, and you lift that other person up, and God 
will deal with that person according to his time and according to his justice and righteousness. So reasons to forgive, it actually ultimately gives you freedom. It's for your own benefit, and it's for your own good health. And so um, today, I want to discuss what happens when we do forgive. Uh, and so um, I wanted to cover this because last week I gave you the like downward roots of bitterness of all those things that happened all the way down to murder if we don't forgive. So today, on the positive note, what happens when we do forgive? And it's excellent, awesome, good stuff happens when we forgive. And there's only three that I want to share. There may be more, but I want to share three specific things that happens when we forgive. First, this bad guy that you see on the screen uh, is an image, imagery of Satan. The first thing that happens when we forgive is a verse in Vietnamese, which you cannot understand. So you guys turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 2.10. And we'll read it in English. But basically, when we forgive, the first thing that happens is we overcome our enemy. So uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11. I'm going to turn there and read it aloud for you. For those of you who have it, follow along in your digital Bibles, your physical Bibles. Um, 2 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11. It says right here, um, for some may say, maybe it's 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, okay, I'm in chapter 10. Hold on. 2, 10 through 11. All right, so anyone you forgive, I also forgive. So there was some bad things that happened at the church in Corinth, and Paul was saying, hey, uh, it's time. It's time that we forgive that person. And so he says, anyone that you forgive, I also forgive. And what I've forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So I want you to understand that Satan has a plan. He has a game plan. And you can understand it in very simple terms. First, who is Satan? Satan is God's enemy. And if you can uh, understand anything about God, you can understand Satan is against everything that God is against because Satan is God's enemy. So you, as God's children, Satan hates you. you whether you know it or whether you don't know it, Satan still hates you. Why? Because you belong to God. You are God's children. And so if, God, if uh, Satan hates God, Satan certainly hates you, and Satan's got a game plan to steal, kill, and destroy you. Now, whether you know it or not, it's still going to happen. And I feel like a lot of people who go throughout life wonder, why did this happen to me? You know, and perhaps we end up blaming God, but it's not God. It's Satan, God's enemy. So the simple way you can understand it is, if God is love, Satan is the one that brings about hate and anger and revenge. If uh, God is unity, Satan is the one that brings about division, arguments, conflicts, broken relationships. So uh, those relationships that are the, the most precious in your life between parents and children, between husbands and wives, be, uh, between friends, you know you have best buddies and they're like, they're like, you know, at a certain age, they're like your life, you know. You would do anything for them. That's, that's good and wholesome. Those are relationships that God has given you. But Satan is out to destroy those relationships, divide those relationships between your friends, your parents, and when you get married, between your husband and your wife. That is Satan's schemes. And if God is the truth, Satan is the father of lies. Satan is the one that comes and tells you, Lie after lie after lie. And I don't want you to understand that, oh, God versus Satan, and they're like wrestling up there in the high heavens and whatever. It's not even a battle. I told you this, and I'll tell you again. Satan has nothing on God because he's got Elriz, and he's got no pool, all right? So I want you to understand that it's not even a fair fight because Satan has nowhere near the power to overcome God. And in the book of Revelation, it says that by the breath of God, Satan was just burned up, 
His whole army was burned up, and he was cast in the lake of fire. End of story, period. So, because Satan has no power, Satan likes to take hostages. Do you guys understand hostages? If Satan was to go rob a bank, and he sees all the guards with the guns, and he can't defeat it with his little, uh, you know, um, uh, six um, bullet, uh, you know, hand clock thing. Um, you guys know the guns. I don't. Um, then what he's going to do, is he going to grab the nearest hostage, like little Christy, all right? Imagine little Christy with her gun, you know, a gun up to her head as the hostage. Satan has no power against God, but Satan takes us as hostages. Why? Because God loves us. God loves us, and we matter to God because we're his children. If we don't mean a thing to God, Satan wouldn't even touch us, all right? And so you have to understand the things that goes on in our lives are Satan's schemes. But today I'm just going to focus on the division, the broken relationships, and the things that come from the broken relationships when we don't forgive. That is Satan's schemes. And it's like Satan always pulling that ace to beat us down and win, win over us. And so with that, all you have to do is forgive. When you forgive, you pull out whatever trumps the ace. I'm not sure about cards too, but you can beat Satan. And you can tear down his lies when we forgive each other. Satan has no power unless we forgive. And so when we forgive, the first thing that we do is we beat Satan. We recognize his evil plan to destroy the relationships in our lives. And we say, nope, not this time. And so this is why I want to tell you how important forgiveness is. And usually I can tell like a very devoted Christian because they do what? They read the Bible every day and they pray every day. Somewhere along the way, someone forgot to teach us to forgive every day. So I want you to add it to the list of important things to do as a Christian every day is to forgive. That's how we overcome Satan each and every day is to forgive. So I want you to say with me, we forgive everyone every day. We forgive. One more time. We forgive. Okay. Make that part of your core Christian life to forgive everyone who does anything against us. And we do it every day. It takes practice. You know, I was writing Hui's letter of recommendation, and I, I wrote it last year, but he didn't use it. He had decided to apply. And I looked back, and I wrote that at 12 years old, he started playing the piano for the church. And I guarantee you, he didn't play that good at 12 years old, right? But what does the piano, preachers, uh, piano teacher say? Practice makes perfect. We're not going to be good at forgiving people right off the bat. Um, but that's why we need to practice forgiving everyone every day. We have to practice it as much as we come to the Lord in prayer every day. We have to practice it just as we practice having daily devotion time, opening our Bibles and reading God's word is part of following Jesus Christ. So today I want to tell you how we can overcome the evil one. That is to forgive Forgive everyone and forgive every day. The second thing that happens um, when we forgive is that we bring about the kingdom of God. So last week, I showed you this very gruesome picture, and Paul warned us that see to it, it's a warning, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, meaning the grace, the goodness of God is there, but somehow you miss it. It's like, it was like there, it's like right in front of you, but you miss it. And you miss it because we, are, we grow bitter, and the bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile 
many of us. And the roots of bitterness is a downward slope. It starts with unforgiveness. It leads to resentment. That's like a slow burning anger. And then the slow burning anger brings back that feeling of retaliation where you need to get revenge. And the more you think about that person and what they did to you, the more it replays in your mind and you get angry. These are the work of the tormentors, the demons that we submit ourselves to and we open the doors to when we don't forgive. And so the demon plays over and over that scene where that person cussed you out or where that person, you know, stabbed your back and it just replays over in your mind and the, every time you see it, you get more angry and that anger turns into hatred and the demon of hatred moves in and the demon of hatred gives you ideas of what you can do to take your revenge and then it leads to death. And I told you about that lady in Texas on the news that you fact read where she murdered her husband in cold blood with a hammer and beat him over the head with a hammer until he died. Then she called 911 and waited for the police. Um, but there's another type of murder that we don't think about that all of us tend to do pretty frequently. When Jesus Christ came, he said that anybody who calls their brother and sister crazy, stupid, idiot, you have committed murder. We commit murder with our tongues, with our words, um, and we don't even recognize it. If our words have the power of creation, just like we were created in the image of God, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, Imagine what you did with those words that you threw out like a knife. It cuts and it cuts and it cuts and it's like a slow bleeding death for that person. And a lot of people, a lot of relationships die a slow, painful death that way. That is murder. So instead of that, let's look up to something much more better, which Jesus Christ suggested for us. So in Luke chapter 6, 27, this is what Jesus Christ said. But to you who are listening, I hope all of you are listening, and to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you or abuse you or cuss at you. And so instead of these bitter roots of bitterness, I want you to think and imagine a tree with strong branches that lifts up into this green, beautiful canopy of healthy leaves and growing. So the first branch is love. Oh, it's in Vietnamese again. That is love. We'll have a lesson in Vietnamese. Ew is love. All right. So first, love your enemies. Um, you know, that is totally backwards from what Instagram teaches you, um, you know, to backstab and to retaliate and to get your revenge when someone uh, does something wrong to you. But Jesus said, love your enemy. What does love mean? Love means that, you know, all those things in 1 Corinthians, you don't count the wrongs. You don't um, plan on revenge. Um, love means loving them how God loved you forgiving them how God forgave you. And the second branch is to do good to those who hate you. Now again, I caution you to use your brain. Think about things. If people have stolen money from you three times, don't let them steal from you a third or fourth or a fifth time. Um, you know, but think about when they're in need, if a person that hated you and they said, man, I'm stuck and they're in need and you're able to do it and you thought about it and it's logical and it's okay, then do it. Do good for those who hate you. And then the third thing, and I'm going to uh, lump the third and the fourth thing together, juk fuk means to bless them. Bless those who curse you and the last one is to pray for those who mistreat you. The first two things, I want you to think they're physical. You can show people kindness. You can speak kind words to them and they can hear it. You can do good things for them when they're in need, even though they hate you. But the second two things, the blessing and the praying for them happens in the spiritual realm. There are things you cannot touch, see, or feel. When you bless someone with your words, you do something 
magnificently great in the spiritual realm. And I give you an example based on a true story. Names have been changed to the protect the identity of those involved, but there is a lady and um, you know, she suffered from years and years of just neglect from her husband. Her husband doesn't treat her right, doesn't value her, and, um, you know, and finally, after all those years, divorced her and took her child away from, he uh, from her. And so, um, you know, we talked about it, and she forgave um, her husband for doing all those things. Um, but then leading her a step for forward, I said, now you should bless those that, um, that, you, that have hurt you. And, you know, and the thing, and I think all of us would say something like it because it's true. We tend to repeat what is happened in the past, and that's true. And so the first things that she say is he's just selfish and he lives for himself um, only. Um, he doesn't pay any attention to anyone else, and he only lives for himself. And so what, have, what has happened in that scenario? Do you think that selfish person is going to start living for the child that they had together or be considerate of her? Absolutely not. Because what she just spoke is kind of like a curse. He is that way. So I want you to understand, it says, bless those who curse you instead of cursing those who curse you. Because when you say negative things, guess what's going to happen in the spiritual realm? All the demons who love to hate, who love to do evil stuff, will grasp onto your words and say, hey, I like those words. Let's go do it, right? And so the demon of selfishness, the demon of just living for themselves, the demon of whatever comes along and grasps those words and carries it out. But instead, if we were to speak blessing and say that I bless that person with the supernatural love of Jesus Christ so that it overflows to all of the people around them, guess what's going to happen? God will honor your word. The Holy Spirit will come along and will work that situation, will um, engage that person to change it according to the positive words that you spoke, according to God's truth. And those words are in the Bible. God blessed Abraham and said that he will be a blessing to others. And so imagine if you spoke those words and that person receives the love of God, receives uh, love from other, and then shows the love of God to others, you would be the one benefiting from it, right? Because now his love is overflowing to you. So I want you to see in the two separate scenarios what speaking a curse would do, what speaking blessings would do in the spiritual realm. That's why Jesus Christ said, bless those who curse you because your words are powerful and God will honor your words. Okay, so this fourth one is pray for those who mistreat you. And I want you to understand that our enemy is behind the things that happen to us in our lives. And we need to see both sides of what's happening. You guys turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And those of you who've been through the spiritual warfare training, you are very familiar with this. We spent like three months on this. So Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to read from verse 11 and 12. And this is what I want you to keep in mind. In verse uh, 11 and 12, it says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. Again, the devil has some schemes. He's got a plan against you. For our struggle is against whom? Is it against your mother and father? Against your best friends? Is it against those who hate you? Those who make your life miserable? Those who post bad stuff about you on Instagram? No, that is not your struggle. It says here, for our struggle, in verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not against people that you can see. Our struggle, our fight, is against the rulers, against the authorities, against 
the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You cannot see these forces, but they are at work in your life. They are dark, they are evil, they are from Satan, and they are demonic. So I want you to understand that in anything that happens to you, yes, there is that person. They made that bad choice, perhaps because um, it was something, you know, but you have to see the other side of it is that there is this demon, there is this evil force speaking into their mind, speaking into their heart, hate, violence, whatever it is, deceit, um, thief, um, stealing, whatever it is that they did to you. You have to recognize both forces. And the only way to come against those forces is through prayer in the spiritual realm. You cannot box or hit or punch um, these rulers and principalities. You have to do it in the spiritual realm. So what you do after you bless that person is you pray against those evil uh, evil spirits, those rulers, those principalities, and those powers in the spiritual realm. And it could be as much as, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ, you know, the thief of money, I command you to leave. If you, um, you know, keep experiencing things that just suck the money and the cash out of you, or you experience conflict after conflict, you can just say, in the name of Jesus, you demon of conflict, I bind and I break your word. And so that's what Jesus Christ really meant, that what we bind on this earth is bound in the heavenly realms. What we loose or what we forgive on this earth is forgiven in the heavenly realms. You have to see two sides of the same story. What we often do is we only see one side of the story, and we think that person who did us wrong is our enemy. It's not just them. So that's why the first two are physical. You show your enemies God's love. You do good to those who hate you, but then you also have to bless them with your words, and you pray against the spiritual forces of evil working in them. Because you know what? Whoever that person is that hurt you so much, God loves them too. God wants to save them too. And so that's... That's Jesus Christ's approach. And when you do all these things, the second thing you do when you forgive is you bring God's kingdom here on earth. Jesus Christ spoke a lot about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God just means a place and a time where the will of God is done. And so uh, when Jesus Christ came, it says in the Bible that the world was sitting in darkness. So imagine Satan just around everybody, doing with everybody what Satan wants, in complete darkness, and the forces of evil was ruling over everyone. And when Jesus Christ came, it was like the light that came. And Jesus said that we are the light of the world also, like a light that is lit um, and should not be covered. When we forgive people, we bring the will of God the kingdom of God into your schools, into your families, into the internet where you communicate with people. You bring about the kingdom of God and you're expanding the kingdom of God on this earth. That's the second thing that happens. Isn't that super awesome, wonderful, that you are the one bringing about the kingdom of God on this earth when you forgive others? All right, so that's what happens. The second thing that happens when you forgive, and the third and final thing that happens when we forgive is why I preach about forgiveness. You will be healed. And so James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The, pr the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You guys want to hear about powerful and effective? Um, I'm not going to tell you anything else except what James said. He said there was a man named Elijah. And Elijah was a normal person, kind of like V, kind of like Jackson, just a normal person. But he can control the weather. Now, I know for a very long time there have been suspicion theories that the Chinese are researching how to control the weather. It used to be Japan 
and it may have been Russia at some point, whatever, somebody was trying to fi figure out a way to control the weather, but that hasn't been done yet. But Elijah, when he prayed, it said that it did not rain for three whole years. Complete famine in the land. And when he prayed again, what happened? Rain fell from the sky. A big, soaking thunderstorm. And so, think of a normal person like you and me being able to do powerful and effective things for the kingdom of God. But we cannot do it if we do not forgive. If we do not forgive, it blocks our prayer. It blocks our healing also. And so, um, when I read uh, James 5, I remember a, a pastor named David Paulson. David Paulson, and I remember him, and this story just kind of lingers in my mind because he came from the same background as I did, just very, you know, Baptist-like. He wasn't Baptist, but... Um, and then one day, he decided to preach about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and then he was baptized in the Holy Spirit as he was researching it and preaching it. And then he read the Bible with brand new set of eyes, and he wanted to do what was written in the Bible. And so for him, James 5 became like a literal thing that you could be healed. And he said that there was a man and this was a true story. There's a man in his church who was always against him. He was the pastor, and that guy, whatever, um, whatever plans that the pastor wanted to do at the church, that, that guy would always shoot him down, shoot his plans down, and they just did not get along. Um, but that man was a businessman, and um, on this day, he was supposed to go leave on a business trip. And uh, he had asthma, and it was very, uh, very severe, and it was seasonal. So, like, every time around the uh, certain season, like the spring, he would get it really bad. Well, this time, he had to go on this very important business trip. So his wife called uh, David Paulson, Pastor Paulson, and said, uh, come over and pray for my husband because um, I think he was out of options. He wanted to go on this business. He had to go on this business trip, but he was too sick to go. So... Uh, David Paulson, with his new understanding of James 5, came over and did James 5 just like a checklist. So they confessed uh, their sins to each other, and he said, you know, I never really liked you. And the other guy said, same. And so they forgave each other for their conflict, and then he poured oil on the man's head, and he prayed, be healed, and then he left. Because uh, he just, that was the first time he didn't know what to expect. He wasn't going to hang around to see if he was going to, uh, you know, what was going to happen. So he left. So the next day, the guy's wife called him and said, oh, he's healed and he's on his way to his business trip. And so I want you to understand that there is a simple simplicity to just doing what God says in the Bible. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. And so I want you to understand something. I do a lot of research about other religions just because, you know, there are other religions out there. And you have to see which one is right and which one is, um, you know, according to the Bible and which one is not and which one is just a matter of preference, like music. Um, you know, the Catholic Church, in some ways, they do their, at their core beliefs, they value the things that the Bible teaches, like confessions of sin. And so, you know, but they, the way they do it is probably not the most optimal. So uh, in the Catholic tradition, you confess your sins to a priest um, on a certain day of the week. Um, and as Protestants, somehow, we totally do away with confession of sins altogether to each other, to the point that some of us says, no person has any right to judge me. And so we don't confess our sins to anybody. It's just you and me and God or, you know, just between us and God. We will confess our sins to God. God will forgive us. End of story. But that's not what James 5 says. It says, confess your sins to who? Each other. There is something very important that happens when we confess our sins to each other so that we may forgive each other so that we may be healed. And I believe 
that some healing does not take place until we confess our sins and ask for forgiveness from the other person. And so I want you to understand, Jesus does change everything, and he has given us very simple steps to achieve the healing. You know, sometimes we read, by his stripes we are healed. We pray, by your stripes we are healed. We don't get the healing. And we say, what's wrong, God? How come I didn't get the healing? Well, we didn't read the other parts about confessing your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that we may be healed. And we forgot to do that part. Simple as that. And so I want to bring this to your attention this morning. Forgiveness is key to a healthy body. If you do not forgive, you will be given over to the tormentors. And you will be sick. Mentally, emotionally, physically in your body. Uh, if you do forgive, you will be healed for your body. There's one thing I want to conclude with, and it's very fitting because we had communion this morning. You guys turn to, in your Bibles, um, 1 Corinthians 11.30. We basically read this verse every single month uh, when we take communion. Um, and I used to, used to not quite understand what the verses before and after it mean, but now, understanding James 5, I want to explain it very clearly to you. 1 Corinthians 11.30. Um, 1 Corinthians 11.30 says that there is another body, and that body needs healing too. Not only your physical body, but the body of Christ. So 1 Corinthians 11.30, I'm going to read from maybe 27. So then, who, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, what is the unworthy manner? In an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. The body of the Lord is the church. We are the body of the Lord. We are the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head, and the people to your right, look to your right. They are your body. Look to the left. They are your brothers and sisters in Christ. They are the body of Jesus Christ. These people that we see that God has joined together, they are the body of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And that is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep or passed away, probably due to the sickness. So I want you to understand that the healing of the body of Christ is very important to Jesus Christ. That's why he said, if you eat and drink without discerning or seeing how important the body of Christ is, how your brothers and sisters in Christ and the relationship and the unity of the Holy Spirit among us is so important to God, there will be sickness also. Those are just very simple words. That's why many of you are weak, many of you are sick, and some of you have fallen asleep or passed away. So I want you to understand, forgiveness is key. Jesus Christ changed everything, and forgiveness is something that we can do that will turn everything around in our lives, everything around between our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, the key thing, one of the main reasons why people leave church is why? They get offended by somebody at church. They go to church, they're a brand new believer, maybe they're an old believer. Someone says something bad to them and they get their feelings hurt. And that's how Satan works. That's how Satan works to rip people out from the body of Christ. But we, we can overcome the schemes of the devil. So forgive each other. And Jesus Christ tells us something very commonsensical. He says that when there's a conflict and someone did something bad to someone, that person, that guilty person who did that bad thing, they're going to feel too guilty to come and say sorry. That's why the person who is innocent, the person who didn't do the guilty stuff, is the first one who should reach out. That is Jesus' plan, and it makes a whole lot of sense because, you know, when you're that guilty dog, you don't want to speak up first, right, because it's just bad. Um, that's why Jesus said, if there's a conflict between you, 
the one who did not do anything wrong should be the first one who reach out to their brothers and sisters. So I want you to understand for the healing of your body, for the prevention of disease and sickness, forgive everyone who does anything against you. Forgive every day. Practice forgiveness as a core thing of being a follower of Jesus Christ. And then confess your sins to each other. Trust me, you don't have to confess your sin to the whole church. Um, just someone who, who you trust at church, your friend, your spiritual guide, your spiritual mentor, you know, confess your sins to each other. And then go to, to that person and confess your sin to that person and ask for forgiveness. I tell you, forgiveness is going to change your whole world. It's going to change your whole life. It's going to change your whole walk with Jesus Christ. And it's going to make you healthy. So in review, I want you to understand um, that when you forgive, you overcome your real enemy, which is Satan and his schemes. You can defeat Satan every single time when you forgive everyone and every day. The second thing that happens when you forgive is you expand God's kingdom right on earth. Jesus Christ said the kingdom of God is not far out there. It is near and it is in you. That's how we expand the kingdom of God, first by forgiving. When we forgive, we do the will of God. The will of God is carried out. You are the light of the world. And the third thing is you're healed. The body of Christ is healed. The church is united, and we are one. Please stand up. And again, I want to make this practical because it's the word practice is in it. And I want to uh, have us do it over and over again so that it becomes second nature to us. So close your eyes. Holy Spirit, we invite you right now. Bring to our mind a picture, a memory of a person who has done us wrong, God whether in our family, whether it be our friends, whether it be um, in the church family, God, show us who we need to forgive that we haven't forgiven yet. And if God has shown you a picture, brought to you a memory of a person who has done you wrong, has hurt you, has deceived you, has cheated you, Forgive them. Choose to forgive them today. And today we're going to take our practice one step further. If you want to go talk to them today to make peace, then let's pray and ask uh, the Holy Spirit to help us. If you want to, repeat after me. Jesus Christ, today I have decided to forgive Say their name. I'll speak over you so no one can hear. Holy Spirit, please help me to mend this broken relationship so that we can forgive each other. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for revealing to us the simple truths of God that we're not deceived, that we don't fall for the plans of Satan to destroy the relationships in our lives, to steal and take things away from us, which you have given us, God, the wonderful, beautiful things in our lives, the people whom we love, the people who love us, God, our, our church, our brothers and sisters in Christ, God. May we never fall for the schemes of uh, the devil, God, and forgive us when we do, God, and teach us, remind us, and bring us um, to the place where we can forgive um, each other, God, and we will be united um, in you. We will be united in your love. We will be united by the bond of peace, which comes from you, God. Holy Spirit, please help us practice forgiving each and every day, God, so that we become forgivers, just like you are, and that you, our Father, um, have forgiven us our sins. We forgive each other, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the dead.
darkness into glorious light. I forgot to say grace, so I'm going to say that now. Thank you, God, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for the unity and all great things that you have given us at our church, God. And may the love of God, the unity uh, of the Holy Spirit, the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ always be with us until we see you face to face. Amen. All right, it's Potluck Sunday. <laughs>